Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So we have come to the concluding lecture of Principles of Systemic Therapy. And in this lecture, we are going to discuss one of the most important and uh, the rapidly uh, becoming popular treatment that is the biologics and their use in dermatology. In addition, in the end of the chapter, in the end of this lecture, we will discuss about the C1 esterase inhibitor replacement therapy and intravenous immunoglobulin therapy. So let's proceed to today's lecture. Biological therapies. Biological therapy, also known as the protein therapeutics, is a term that encompasses a group of pharmacologically active protein-based molecules produced by the living organisms that are designed to alleviate the disease by inhibiting or imitating the actions of naturally occurring proteins. So in this definition, there are several important points to be noted. The first is that biological therapies are pharmacologically active therapies and they are protein-based molecules which are produced by living organisms and are once given or injected or used, they cure the diseases by either inhibition or stimulation of naturally occurring proteins within the body. Insulin could be considered as the first biological therapy to treat diabetes, while pooled immunoglobulins are the other agents. We are going to discuss about the immunoglobulins today. The advent of recombinant DNA technology this is a synthetic way to produce proteins, allow, allows the large-scale production of recombinant protein with highly specific structure and function in health that led to an exponential increase in drug development in field of biological therapy. So there was a time when the biological therapies are derived from the animal origin or murine origin or chimeric origin. But now, because of this uh, technology known as the recombinant DNA, these biologics are produced in the laboratory and uh, are uh, produced for different novel indications. The biological therapies uh, that are, include those that are identical to the endogenous proteins and functions either to replenish or to enhance an endogenous protein, for example, interferons or pooled immunoglobulins. So many a time we give interferons and these interferons are similar to the natural interferons. Biological therapy also include uh, using the specificity of antigen recognition site of immunoglobulins, which are called as the monoclonal antibodies. So these are the antigen recognition site of immunoglobulins or monoclonal antibodies or the receptor binding domains of the native protein ligands, which is called as immunoadhesions, immunoadhesins, to guide the immune system to destroy the relevant molecule or the cell. So the monoclonal antibodies, which are uh, very popular biologics nowadays, are actually the antigen recognition sites of the immunoglobulins. And uh, in addition, immunoadhesins are, um, are also part of the biologics. And these uh, proteins, they guide the immune system to destroy the relevant molecule or the cell. Now, um, we are going to discuss a few facts regarding these biological therapies. Number one, a high degree of functional specificity 
and extracellular binding results in fewer of target actions so in comparison to other uh, drugs like immunosuppressives steroids which uh, effect on a um, uh, on a larger scale on uh, some non specific targets the biological therapies are very microscopically targeted proteins as a result of which there are uh, much lesser chances of off target or side effects number 2 the complexities of biological systems are such that the interruption of the particular pathway may result in undesired pharmacodynamic effects for example reactivation of latent tuberculosis with tumor necrotic factor alpha agonist therapy and the cytokine storm triggered by cd28 agonist in six volunteers so uh, having discussed that the biologics have a few side effects but because of some specificity of their mechanism of action a few specific targeted side effects are expected one of those is the um, tumor necrotic factor alpha inhibitors causes reactivation of latent tuberculosis because tumor necrotic factor alpha is an important cytokine for suppression of uh, tuberculosis so by inhibiting that cytokine the late the tb can be reactivated and similarly while developing cd28 agonists it was found that by giving these agonists there is a cytokine storm cytokine storm is a similar mechanism by which several deaths occur in covid-19 pandemic because of the cytokine storm which the virus initiated so such kind of targeted small scale side effects are expected from biological therapy number 3 these drugs are proteins and have to be given parenterally and also that immunogenicity remain a significant problem even in context of the fully humanized mono fully human monoclonal antibodies such as adalimumab so since all these agents are um, Uh, are immunogenic uh, that's why there can be some uh, immunogenicity problem while giving the biologics a number of biological therapies are available for use in um, in rapidly increasing way and the disease indications are constantly increasing but the main issue is the cost associated with these agents because uh, their preparation their marketing everything is very expensive so everyone cannot afford these biological therapies the access to these therapies have improved with advent of biosimilars the biosimilars are a new ad, uh, ad, um, addition these are the biological medicines that are similar to a known biological medicine without any significant difference in the term of quality safety and efficacy by bio biosimilars you remember that uh, whenever a drug is being developed by a pharmaceutical company uh, since the pharmaceutical company invest millions of dollars in its development there is a, a year, there is a, a time period when that pharmaceutical company has a right to produce that drug only and no other pharmaceutical company can develop that drug once that time period lapses other companies can prepare the similar drug and of course because these are the companies who have not invested in the development of the drug they would keep the price of those drugs lower than the original company price and these drugs which are prepared by the other pharmaceutical companies who were not um, involved in the development of that particular drug these uh, chemicals are called as biosimilars so the biosimilars have absolutely no difference from the original biologics but they are just little cheaper 
Treatment with biological therapy should always be supervised by experienced clinicians. So, uh, uh, these biological therapies are given uh, lots of fancy names, but these names which are attached with these biological agents have some logic. So, the suffix is the, uh, for, for a word, suffix means the end words. So, if um, yeah, the, uh, the blue color means those uh, proteins which are developed from the mouse, also known as the chimeric, and uh, the purple is the human. So, if we use the word MAB in the end, uh, the common stem for all the monoclonal antibodies. Uh, MAB is the word which is used for the M is for monoclonal and AB is for the antibodies. So MAB is, if a biologic end with MAB, it means that it's a monoclonal antibody. If it is Zymab, the suffix include X, I and MAB, it means that uh, this monoclonal antibody is of chimeric origin, that is the mouse origin. The, uh, the common example is infliximab and rituximab. Uh, so, Z means chimeric and MAB is monoclonal antibody. But if it ends with Zumab, it means it is humanized. Not actually human, but close to the human. Li like umalizumab. The umalizumab is a very commonly used uh, biologic in Pakistan with the name of Fraseron or uh, Cosantex. So, it is... Uh, sorry. Mm. So, umalizumab is... Um, So, sorry, the umelizumab is uh, Zolar, which is a common uh, biologic which is used for chronic urticaria. And uh, uh, the uh, this phaseron um, uh, or uh, Cosentix is uh, Sikikunimab. So, umelizumab is, uh, con contains the suffix of uh, Zumab. It means it is humanized. Then there is another suffix which is UMAP. Now in this suffix, Z is not included. So this is a purely human. So this purely human, that means adelimumab. Adelimumab is a purely human-derived biologics. Uh, then there is another suffix which you will see in different biological agents and this is the sept. That like eternocept or uh, relanocept. So sept is the uh, receptor molecules native or modified. So uh, sept is, uh, uh, comes from receptors. Uh, sept is the receptor. Like eternocept or relanocept. So, revising again, if uh, an, a biological agent end with Z-MAB, it means it's a monoclonal antibody which is derived from the mouse or chimeric origin. If it is Z-MAB, Z-U-M-A-B, it means that it is derived from human. And if it is U-MAB, it is purely human. If, and if it ends with CEPT, it means it's a receptor molecule. So, we are going to discuss the first um, biological agents which um, with, with whom the actual biological therapies started. And these are the tumor necrotic factor antagonists. The tumor necrotic factor is a pro-inflammatory cytokine produced by a wide variety of cell types including the keratinocytes. It plays a complex role in innate immunity and host defense, particularly against the mycobacterium infection and can both enhance and suppress the adaptive immunity. 
over the last 15 years, it has been shown to play a central role in pathogenesis of number of chronic inflammatory disease states. These tumor necrotic factor alpha in the last 15 years have been shown to play a central role in pathogenesis of many inflammatory disease. There are currently two types of biological agents that target tumor necrotic factor alpha. The first are the monoclonal antibodies that bind directly to the tumor necrotic factor alpha and are represented by adalimumab, sertozumumab, sertoleuzumab, uh, uh, golimumab, and infliximab. Then there is a second class of uh, biologics, which are the fusion proteins or the receptor blockers like Eternacept, which completely inhibits the binding of tumor necrotic factor alpha to tumor necrotic factor alpha receptors. So inhibiting the biological activity of tumor necrotic factor alpha. Dermatological use. The license indication of tumor necrotic factor alpha antagonists are the severe psoriasis and adalimumab, eternacept, and infliximab have been shown to be very effective. Golimumab and sertizumab are currently licensed only for psoriatic arthritis. The off-label uses in dermatology, including the skin diseases, um, which are associated with inflammatory bowel disease and rheumatoid arthritis, like pyoderma ganglionosum, sweet syndrome, hyderadenitis suppurativa, and Bechet disease. And severe treatment resistant and severe treatment resistant cutaneous sarcoidosis has also been reported to benefit from infliximab and adalimumab. So the off-label uses include pyoderma ganglionosum, sweet syndrome, hyderadenitis suppurativa, Bechet disease, and cutaneous sarcoidosis. So this uh, um, table shows a comparison between the doses uh, of infliximab, adalimumab, and eternacept. So infliximab is the only drug which is used intravenous and given a slow infusion for two hours. Rest, adalimumab and eternacept are given subcutaneous. Dose of infliximab is 5 mg per kilogram per week, uh, 5 mg uh, weekly, and it is given at week 0, 2, 6, and then 8 weekly. Adalimumab is given 80 mg at week 0, then 40 mg at week 1, and then 40 mg every other week, given fortnightly. While Eternacept is easy, it is given 50 mg weekly from the start. Bioavailability in Fleximab is 100% bioavailable. Adalimumab is 64% and Eternacept 74%. Pharmacological properties of the infliximab, as it shows, as the suffix shows, Zmab is a chimeric human murine monoclonal antibody. Whereas the golimumab and adalimumab are fully, fully human IgG1 antibodies. Eternacept is a fusion protein. We have discussed this topic. Administration. As mentioned in the table before, all the tumor necrotic factor agonists, antagonists are given parenterally. Um, infliximab is given intravenous, rest all are given subcutaneously by self administered or auto injector. Drug immunogenicity. In common with all tumor necrotic factor antagonists, they generate a immune response with consequent development of anti-drug antibodies. This is an important mechanism underlying the treatment failure. 
The mechanism also contribute to the adverse event profile. So this development of um, anti-drug antibody is a peculiar side effect of tumor necrotic factor antagonists. Although majority of patients develop anti-drug antibodies within the first six months of therapy, not all lose treatment efficacy as antibodies may be transient or at a low level. Notably, methotrexate and possibly other immunosuppressive drugs significantly reduce the development of anti-drug antibodies and often and is often co-prescribed with many, many tumor necrotic factor antagonists. The individual variability in development of tolerance of the immune response appear to be related to multiple factors. Uh, number one, route and dose schedule. For example, uh, initial high dose and continuous dosing may confer reduced risk. So most of the tumor necrotic factor alpha have a loading dose and then the rest of the dose is um, less than the loading dose. Then route of administrations and patient factors like genetic factors and level of disease activity. So patient factors also contribute to development of the anti drug antibodies. That is whether uh, th that is the genetic makeup of patients and the level of disease activity. Pharmacodynamics. The tumor necrotic factor alpha bind to two distinct receptors, the TNF receptor 1 and TNF receptor 2. And this lead to NFKB activation, which promotes inflammation and cell apoptosis. All TNF antagonists act by blocking tumor necrotic factor receptor mediated mechanisms, inducing uh, TM tumor necrotic factor reverse signaling events. Etanercept also binds to members of lymphotoxin family LT alpha 3 and LT alpha 2 beta 1. Adverse effects. The principal side effects include injection side, site reaction, infusion reactions by infliximab, and infections. So injection reaction, infusion reaction, and infections, all I. Reactivation of tuberculosis is a particular risk given the role of TNF in host defense against mycobacterium infection and granuloma formation. Heart failure, both new onset and worsening of pre-existing heart disease and demyelinating disorders have also been reported. Paradoxically, new onset psoriasis, including palmo, plantar, pustulosis, and sarcoidosis, has de have developed in patients on TNF antagonist, particularly when given for rheumatological indications or Crohn's disease. Then other side effects include idiosyncratic hepatic, hepatic reactions, autoimmune hepatitis, cytopenias, pancytopenias, and serious opportunistic infection has already been mentioned. There is ongoing concern about whether or not TNF antagonists confer an increased risk of malignancy, particularly in relation to lymphoma and skin cancer. However, this answer is yet to be completely resolved. Contraindications. The contraindications of TNF antagonists include the presence of severe cardiac failure, a personal history of demyelinating disease, some active infection, untreated latent tuberculosis, or current or recent past history of malignancy. Live and attenuated vaccines may potentially lead to severe and fatal infection. So this is also a contraindication to TNF-alpha antagonists. Drug-drug interactions. 
There is no clinically important interaction between TNF antagonist and small molecule drugs. With exception of methotrexate, co-administration with other immunomodulatory agents should generally be avoided due to potential for increased risk of infection. The best combination with TNF antagonist is with methotrexate. Caution. Patient with multiple comorbidities who are older or have history of cancer are increased risk of serious adverse effect should be carefully reviewed and monitored if the drug is given. Caution is also required when considering it uh, to be given to patients with chronic viral infections, including hepatitis B and C, and HIV due to risk of reactivation and progression. So generally, these drugs should be avoided in active infections like these. During Use during pregnancy and breastfeeding should be avoided whenever possible. TNF antagonists are excreted in breast milk. Surgery whilst on TNF is associated with increased risk of post-operative infections. Pre-treatment screening. All the patients should have comprehensive history taken and clinical examination and appropriate investigation. Contra conception should be a planned conception, pregnancy and travel given the risk of tuberculosis and possible vaccination requirements should be discussed. While giving TNF antagonist uh, to a married, uh, to a female, uh, the, con the future conception should be planned and pregnancy. And if there is a history of travel abroad, then it should be mentioned. A screening for latent tuberculosis, including chest x-ray and Montu test should always be included in the pre-treatment screening. Monitoring. Once the patient is on TNF antagonist, careful clinical review and advice to patient to seek early medical review in case of any new symptomatology and routine blood investigation like full blood CP, renal and liver functions uh, on regular basis like monthly or uh, quarterly. Then annual IGRA for people who work or live in high-risk setting or travel to high-prevalence countries should be given, should be, should be um, ordered. And this is for latent tuberculosis. Then infliximab. We are now going to discuss the individual drugs briefly. Infliximab has an efficacy in psoriatic nail disease and in psoriatic arthritis as well. In contrast to other tumor necrotic factor antagonist inhibitory drugs, this drug is given intravenous in a dose of 5 mg per kilogram at week 0, 2, 6, and then every 8 weeks. A response is often seen after the first infusion and 80% of patients achieve PASC 75. That is reduction of PASI score by 75%. It is suitable in urgent circumstances such as erythrodermic psoriasis and generalized pustular psoriasis. So for rapid effect, this is a good drug. The entry drug antibodies are reported in high proportion of individuals and correlate with low serum drug levels. There is loss of efficacy and development of infusion reaction. So, if the drug is given at doses which are less than the recommended doses, the chances of, become, become of developing of anti-drug antibodies increases. So, the drug should always be given in the recommended dose. These effects are reduced if the drug is combined with methotrexate. Eternacept. Eternacept has slower onset of effect than infliximab. And the effect manifests in 4 to 8 weeks, not immediately. PASC 75 is achievable at 12 weeks in 34% with 25 mg twice weekly. And there is some loss of efficacy after 1 to 2 years. The licensed dose of Eternacept is 25 mg administered twice a week or 50 mg administered once a week, up to 12 weeks. Then response, this is maintained for about 96 weeks. 
Itanercept is also found to be effective in treatment of pediatric psoriasis in the dose around 0.8 mg per kg. Itanercept has been combined safely with phototherapy, with acitretin and with methotrexate. Adalimumab. Adalimumab is a high efficacy drug in psoriasis and also licensed for psoriatic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, polyarticular juvenile idiopathic arthritis, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. The onset of treatment response in psoriasis is rapid, being significant at 2 weeks and maximal at 12 weeks and 16 weeks. Parsi 75 at 16 weeks is achievable in almost 71 to 80 percent of patients on adalimumab. The licensed dose is 80 mg at week 0, then half the dose that is 40 mg every other week and continuing for 3 years. Patient on adalimumab therapy may develop anti-drug antibodies, but the chances of development of anti-drug antibodies at adalimumab is less than uh, development against infliximab and etanercept. Now we are going to discuss the second class of biologics used in dermatology, that is interleukin-23 and interleukin-17 antagonists. The drug that targets interleukin-23 and interleukin-17 include NTP40 monoclonal antibodies, ustikunumab, NT23 monoclonal antibodies, uh, guselicumab, and the interleukin-17 antagonist, sikikunumab, ixikuzumab, and brodilumab. So among this category include NTP40 monoclonal antibodies, interleukin-23 monoclonal antibodies, and interleukin-17 antagonists. The striking efficacy of all these agents in psoriasis underpins the clinical importance of interleukin-23 inter TH17 axis in the disease pathogenesis. Ustikunimab. Ustikunimab is licensed for the use of plaque psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. A small series suggests efficacy in palmoplantar pustulosis. There have been recent reports of its value in treating PRP, Petrasis rubra pilaris. It's a fully human IgG1K monoclonal antibody that binds with specificity to P40 protein subunits of human cytokine interleukin-12 and interleukin-23. So, Stikunimab binds to P40 protein subunits of interleukin-12 and interleukin-23 and it is available as self-administered subcutaneous injection. Pharmacodynamics. Stikunimab binds specifically to P40 protein subunit and thereby preventing interleukin-12 and 23 from, from binding to the interleukin-12 receptors. Uh, which are expressed on T-cells, nature killer cells, and antigen-presenting cells. The marked efficacy is linked to to be attributed to inhibition of interleukin-23, which has a central role in the pathway in the pathogenesis of psoriasis. So by doing this, it inhibits interleukin-23 and inhibits the pathogenesis of psoriasis. The potential adverse effects. Nasopharyngitis, headache, upper respiratory infection, and injection site reaction are the most commonly reported adverse effects. Possible short-term increase in adverse cardiovascular event may occur. Long-term safety data for Ustikunimab are limited to 5 years. Contraindication include the active infection or untreated latent tuberculosis a current or recent past history of malignancy and live vaccination within two weeks preceding the first injection or 15 weeks after the last injection. So, the live vaccine should not be given. 
drug drug interaction co therapy with other immunosuppressant should be avoided due to risk of excess immunosuppression and there is limited data on safety of such such combinations pre treatment screen the recommended pre treatment assessment is same as for tumor necrotic factor antagonists dose and regimen the starting licensed dose is in less than 100 kg individual is 45 mg and more than 100 kg individual it is 90 mg at the week 04 and then at 12 weekly intervals thereafter monitoring is same as for tumor necrotic factor antagonists then interleukin 17 inhibitors there is an increased number of interleukin 17a positive cells found in involved surat cis skin compared to the control there are currently three interleukin 17 inhibitors in use for the treatment of psoriasis that are brodilumab ixi Cuzumab and Sikikunimab. Among these, Sikikunimab is available in Pakistan, and Sikikunimab and Ixikuzumab targets interleukin 17A, while Brodilumab targets subunit of interleukin 17 receptors, that is interleukin 17 RA. Each appears to be rapidly and profoundly effective. Sikikunimab. It's a fully human monoclonal antibodies to interleukin 17A. The dose is 300 mg or 150 mg, administered once weekly for five weeks and then four weekly. It produces uh, PASI 75 at 12 weeks in 77.1 to 88.6 percent individuals. The sikikunimab has been reported as effective in psoriatic arthritis as well. Brodilumab, it is given in a dose of 70 mg, 140 mg, or 210 mg subcutaneously on week 1, 2, 4, 6, and 10, or 280 mg subcutaneous at day 1, week 4, and week 8. So these are the different ways to give brodilumab. It causes significant neutropenia in two out of two hundred and ten cases. Ixikuzumab is given in a dose of ten mg, twenty five mg, seventy five mg, or one fifty mg subcutaneous at week zero, two, four, eight, twelve, and sixteen, producing a PASI seventy five at twelve weeks in eighty two point one percent. in those which are treated with 150 mg in 82.8% in those treated with 75 mg and 76% in those treated with 25 mg so even 25 mg ixikuzumab appears to be effective response are generally sustained for 52 weeks so there are five injections sorry six injections 0 2 4 A twelve and sixteen, and by giving twenty five mg or seventy five mg, round about seventy five to eighty percent of the patients achieve PASI seventy five by twelve weeks, and the effect is sustained by fifty two weeks. Now we are going to discuss the third category of uh, biologics, that is interleukin one antagonist. Interleukin one plays a central role in wide range of inflammatory conditions. and the number of novel biological agents targeting interleukin 1 uh, are effective in pustular skin diseases such as auto inflammatory disorders in bacchus disease in sapho syndrome which is synovitis acne pustulosis hyperostosis and osteitis anna kinra is the in recombinant interleukin 1 receptor antagonist and is administered as a single daily self administered subcutaneous injection 100 mg per day in adults or 1 to 2 mg per kg per day the bioavailability is 95% with rapid renal clearance adverse effect include injection site reaction allergic reactions anaphylaxis 
infection, neutropenia, and raised liver enzymes. Other interleukin-1 antagonists include canicunumab. It's a monoclonal antibody binding to endogenous interleukin-1 beta and uh, preventing the interaction with interleukin-1 receptors. It is administered as a single dose, 150 milligram or 2 milligram per kg, escalating as indicated by the clinical response with maintenance therapy at eight week interval. Adverse event profile is similar to anakinra. Then, rilonacept, interleukin 1 trap, is a dimeric fusion protein that blocks primarily interleukin 1b signaling and to less extent interleukin 1 alpha signal available only in USA. The fourth category of drug we are going to discuss are the B cell direct biological therapies. The available B cell direct therapy has until recently been limited to rituximab, which is a potent B cell depleting and anti CD20 monoclonal antibody that was originally developed for the treatment of wide range of B cell malignancy, including cutaneous B cell lymphoma. However, belimumab is now licensed for the use in SLE, targeting surface bound proteins on B cells that may have the clinical utility in autoimmune inflammatory skin diseases. Rituximab, their dermatological use. It is licensed for use in combination with glucocorticoids for the induction of remission in adults with ANCA-associated vasculitis, that is Wagner granulomatosis and microscopic polyangitis. The off-label use include wide spectrum of autoimmune chronic inflammatory diseases including vasculitis, pemphigus, SLE, dermatomyositis, primary Jogren syndrome, usually in combination with other immunomodulatory agents. Pharmacological properties. Rituximab is in, in, in IgG1 chimeric mouse or human anti-CD20 monoclonal antibodies. It is Zmab. It appears to be a chimeric origin. Administration. Rituximab is given by slow intravenous infusion uh, over period of 6 to 8 hours. Pre-medication with analgesics or antipyretics, paracetamol, antihistamine, chlorpheniramine, and a glucocorticoids, methylprednisolone, solocortive is given to avoid infusion reactions. Pharmacokinetics. In non-malignant conditions, the mean terminal half-life following IV infusion is around 20 days. Pharmacodynamics. Following binding of rituximab, fab fragment or to, uh, of the uh, CD20 B cell, lysis occur. So B cell lysis occur. The naive B cell disappear rapidly from the peripheral blood circulation and from the tissues. The circulating B cell population recovers to normal over ensuing 3 to 6 months. Since CD20 antigen is not expressed by pro or pre B cells or by terminally differentiated plasma cells, rituximab does not prevent regeneration of CD20 positive B cells and does not directly interfere with immunoglobulin production. It only affects the current B cells which are CD20 positive. Adverse effect. Infusion reactions are common and occur in 25% of patients following the first infusion and most are mild to moderate. There is predisposition to infection, including serious and opportunistic infection, the herpes zoster, candidiasis, and progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. Cytopenias, including neutropenia, may occur months after treatment. Human antichimeric antibody developed in 25% of patients treated and can be associated with worsening of infusion or allergic reaction and failure to deplete B cells, although not predictably so. 
the contraindications. Contraindicated in active infections, in severely immunocompromised patients, patients with uncontrolled heart disease or heart failure, and those who have received live, live vaccination within four weeks of infusion. Caution. Patient with pre-existing heart disease should be closely monitored. Caution should be excised when considering use of rituximab in patient with history of recurrent or chronic infections. There is no specific drug-drug interaction with rituximab. Pre-treatment screening. Screening for rituximab aim in identifying patient with cardiovascular history disease, current or past infection. Um, this include past history of TB, blood-borne infections like HIV, hepatitis B and C. Vaccination status against pneumococcus and influenza and travel plans should also be discussed as live vaccine is not to be given uh, four weeks prior and during rituximab therapy. Importance of avoidance of pregnancy during and for 12 months post-infusion should be emphasized. Common recommended additional investigations include full blood count, renal and liver functions, serum immunoglobulins and lymphocyte subsets. Dose and regimen. For most dermatological conditions, two cycles of treatment is given, 375 mg per meter square, or 1 gram total dose 2 weeks apart. Subsequent, this is called as rheumatoid arthritis regimen or RA regimen. Subsequent cycles may be given on disease relapse if necessary, but not before 6 months. Monitoring. Ongoing monitoring is necessary for signs of infection, for neurological disturbance, and routine blood investigation like full blood count, renal and liver function should be carried out on regular intervals, preferably monthly. Omalizumab. This is the fifth category of biologic we are going to discuss. Omalizumab was first licensed for use in severe allergic IgE-mediated asthma. And more recently, it is found to be effective in chronic urticaria. The dermatological use, the license used uh, as an add-on therapy in treatment of chronic spontaneous urticaria in adults and in adolescents, 12 years and above, with inadequate response to H1 antihistamine therapy. So this is an add-on therapy. It is not the only therapy. Off-label, it is used in resistant atopic eczema with variable outcomes. Pharmacological property. Omalizumab is a recombinant human monoclonal antibodies, IgG1K, against C eta 3 domain of IgE. Given by subcutaneous injection, following injection, absolute bioavailability is 62% reaching peak serum concentration in 6 to 8 days and elimination half-life of 24 days. Pharmacodynamics. Omelizumab binds specifically to IgE only, free IgE only. This results in lower serum level of IgE, preventing the IgE binding to its receptors and subsequent down-regulation of receptor expression on basophils, mast cells and dendritic cells. These mechanisms clearly play a key role in treatment and effects of urticaria, which are caused by autoreactive immunoglobulin G antibodies against these receptors, or IgE or autoreactive IgE antibodies against the autoallergens. Potential adverse effect. The most common adverse effect with omalizumab is headache, sinusitis, joint pain, upper respiratory tract infection, and injection site reaction. Type 1 allergic reactions including anaphylaxis is reported usually within 2 hours of injection but occasionally up to 24 hours post-injection. Rare effects after prolonged use include the arterial thromboembolic event such as a stroke, TIA, myocardial infection, anaphylaxis, 
and abnormal immune responses to parasitic infections. Drug-drug interactions not, not identified. Contraindication include hypersensitivity reaction to melizumab after or injection recipients. Caution. Patients should be warned about the possibility of anaphylaxis reaction. Uh, so first injection should always be supervised. <laughs> Pre-treatment screening. Include routine history, clinical assessment, blood tests like full blood count, liver and renal functions, and dozing is based on serum IgE levels. The licensed dose for chronic urticaria is 300 mg subcutaneous every four weeks. And the first injection should be given supervised. Monitoring routine blood investigation should be undertaken particularly to exclude thrombocytopenias. Now we are going to discuss a uh, novel therapy, uh, which is the C1 esterase inhibitor replacement therapy. Three forms of C1 esterase inhibitors, C1 INH replacement therapy are approved for the use in hereditary angioedema, type 1 and type 2. And these three are, include uh, sin rays, berry nerd, which are both derived from human plasma, and reusin, which are recombinant interleukin-1 inhibitor concentrate purified from the rabbit breast milk. The C1, N, uh, C1 esterase inhibitor replacement therapy is given as an intravenous infusion either as short-term prophylaxis prior to a procedure at high risk of triggering an attack like surgery or extensive dental work or as an emergency intervention during an acute attack. So this infusion is given either before a um, procedure or during an acute attack. The SINRIS is licensed for routine prevention of recurrent hereditary angioedema every 1,000, for example, 1,000 international unit every three to four days. The last um, biologic we are going to discuss today is the intravenous immunoglobulin therapy. The intravenous immunoglobulin refers to the intravenous infusion of high dose of <clears throat> human immunoglobulin pooled from plasma of thousands of healthy donors. <clears throat> it is used as a replacement therapy in primary and secondary immunodeficiency syndromes with impaired antibody production. Intravenous immunoglobulins have an immunomodulatory action and then licensed in UK for use in primary immune thrombocytopenias and given Bari syndrome and in Kawasaki disease. The dermatological uses. All are off-label and it is used as a monotherapy or combination therapy as an immunomodulatory drug in a variety of conditions like autoimmune bullous disorders, pemphigus, pemphigoid, EBA and linear IgA disease when other form of therapies are not very effective. It is also used in autoimmune connective tissue diseases like dermatomyositis, systemic sclerosis, and SLE, and miscellaneous other conditions that include chronic autoimmune urticaria, graft versus host disease, and scleromyx edema. <clears throat> the pharmacological properties. Intravenous immunoglobulins are given intravenously and adequate hydration of patients should be administered, established prior to its infusion. Pharmacokinetics. Following the infusion, intravenous immunoglobulin is distributed relatively rapidly between the intra and extravascular compartments with equilibrium within three to five days. Intravenous immunoglobulin crosses, uh, crosses the placenta and is treated in breast milk. Half-life of immunoglobulins are generally degraded by cells of reticular endothelial system is approximately four weeks. 
pharmacodynamics, the mechanisms underlying the immunomodulatory role of intravenous immunoglobulins is poorly understood. But it is sufficient to say that intravenous immunoglobulin has complex effects on both innate and adaptive component of immune system. And these include blockade of FC receptors on B lymphocytes by natural antibodies resulting in reduction of pathogenic autoantibody generation, cytokine production, and B cell apoptosis. So by blocking the FC receptors on macrophages, it inhibits the secretion of pro-inflammatory cytokines and on granulocyte by inhibiting the degranulation of the granulocytes. So it binds to the FC component of B cells and prevent the production of um, autoantibodies and cytokine production and prevent the B cell damage. It binds on the macrophages and inhibit the secretion of pro-inflammatory cytokines. It binds on the granulocytes and inhibit, inhibit the degranulation of the granulocytes. Potential adverse effects. It is generally a, have a good safety profile with mild side effects which are transient and there are low incidence of serious side effects. Older patients tend to have a greater risk of acute renal failure and venous or arterial thrombosis. The general infusion related effects. Symptoms include fatigue, malaise, shivering, raised temperature, flushing, headache, myalgia, arthralgia, back pain, chest tightness, dyspnea, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, rashes, blood pressure variation and tachycardia are all expected after the intravenous immunoglobulin injection. These side effects usually settle if the infusion rate is slowed or temporarily discontinued and may be reduced by pretreatment with analgesics, antihistamines, NSAIDs, and low dose intravenous corticosteroids like solocotif. Potential adverse effects include aseptic meningitis, presenting with headache, fever, photophobia, neck stiffness, and vomiting is a rare adverse effect. Tend to occur 48 hours after the infusion. Patient with pre existing migraine are more susceptible. Prognosis for aseptic meningitis is good and usually symptomatic treatment is all that is required. Ensuring adequate pre-treatment hydration, pre-medication analgesics and antihistamines and slow rate of infusion enable slow rate of infusion may enable the continuation of the therapy. Infection risk. As it's a biological product derived from pooled human plasma, Intravenous immunoglobulin carries the potential risk of transmission of pathogens, which is minimized by use of donor selection, screening for donations, and scrupulous preparation of, the, uh, of these globulins. Nonetheless, the possibility of transmitting infection with known or unknown organisms cannot be totally excluded. Then thrombotic events. By increasing the blood viscosity, and decreasing its flow, intravenous immunoglobulins is associated with increased risk of venous and arterial thrombosis, embolic complications including DVT, pulmonary embolism, myocardial infarction and cerebrovascular accidents. So thrombotic events should be looked for. Intravenous immunoglobulin related arterial thrombosis is associated with significant mortality. The risk factor for thrombotic events include old age, arterial hypertension, atherosclerosis, obesity, immobility, dehydration, diabetes, hyperviscosity syndrome, and hypercholesterolemia. So all these should be taken care of. The risk of thrombotic events may be reduced by slow infusion, lower dose, and prophylactic aspirin or low molecular weight heparin. Hemolysis. Hemolytic transfusion reactions with intravenous immunoglobulin are uncommon. Although non-O blood group recipients 
with underlying inflammatory disorders appear to be at risk. So if you give immunoglobulins to A or B or AB group, then there are more chances of hemolysis reaction. It manifests as drop in hemoglobulin following intravenous immunoglobulin therapy, elevated unconjugated bilirubin, elevated lactic dehydrogenase, and positive direct Coombe test. Immediate management is to stop the infusion. If red cell replacement is required, give the red cells. Group O should be given. <clears throat> to minimize the risk of further hemolytic transfusion reaction, a cross-matching must be done between the intravenous immunoglobulin preparation and the recipient. IgA-mediated anaphylaxis and hypersensitivity reaction. This is a rare side effect and can induce anaphylaxis. Acute kidney injury. Intravenous immunoglobulin may cause an acute renal damage by inducing osmotic nephrosis in which cells of proximal renal tubules are damaged. The risk factor for acute kidney injury include age more than 65, diabetes, pre-existing renal impairment, dehydration, and concomitant administration of other nephrotoxic drugs. Any risk factor, if present, um, diuretics should be avoided during transfusion, and hydration is maintained and infu infusion rate is reduced. Contraindication include severe anaphylaxis resulting from previous infusion, acute kidney injury or thrombosis. Caution. Include that the infusion rate should not be fast. Uh, intravenous immunoglobulin admission may impair the efficacy of live attenuated vaccines for up to three months and one year for uh, measles. Drug-drug interaction. Immediately before and after infusion, Loop diuretics should be advised because it causes dehydration and dehydration creates side effects with intravenous immunoglobulin therapy. Dose and regimens. Starting dose, standard dose for um, high dose intravenous immunoglobulin therapy for a skin condition is 2 gram per kilogram per cycle in divided doses over 2 to 5 days. So total dose is calculated as 2 gram per kg and it is given in two to five days in one cycle. The cycles are repeated approximately monthly, monthly intervals until effective disease control is obtained. After which the intervals may be increased to 16 weeks. Fluid intake should always be encouraged during and after the infusion. Pre-medications include Pre-medication include paracetamol with or without codeine and NSAIDs and antihistamine. In patients susceptible to thrombosis, aspirin or low molecular weight heparin are prophylactic options. Monitoring. During and immediately after intravenous immunoglobulin infusion, the vital signs, hydration status to exclude both fluid overload and dehydration and urine output should be monitored. Post-transfusion, a blood count with film, a bilirubin level should be done to exclude hemolysis. Mobility should be encouraged in all patients to minimize the risk of thrombosis. So this brings to end of this lecture and this chapter, that is the principles of systemic therapy. So inshallah, I'll meet you next time with another uh, topic. Thank you very much for your uh, time and patient listening. Goodbye and have a good day.